Welcome to this panel video with and about self-diagnosed systems for the Plural Positivity World Conference 2023. This is the Stronghold System. We had the honor of interviewing these amazing systems to learn more about their experiences with DID and OSDD as self-diagnosed systems. This video was created in November 2022 in response to the ISSTD conference video in which they addressed self-diagnosed systems and social media content by systems. They included clips of content by systems, who didn't consent to their content being used in a conference. To protect those systems' privacy, the ISSTD removed the username watermark of the TikTok clips, which per the U.S. Copyright Act, Section 1202, removing a watermark without the official owner's consent is illegal. But the ISSTD conference video was only seen by those able and willing to pay the $400 to access the conference. Around 50 people saw the session live, so we didn't want to draw more attention to it. We decided to release this video when it was a better time to do so. Then on March 22, 2023, McLean Hospital uploaded a conference session to their public YouTube channel. One of the people who spoke was from the ISSTD conference. This video was again ableist, sanist, and uncalled for, and might break DMCA copyright laws. So, we are grateful to the self-diagnosed systems who have participated in this panel. It is a brave thing to do, and we are proud of their activism, boldness, and the open conversation we had together. We can't wait to introduce them to you, but before we do that, here is a short clip by Obscura, which shows the other end of the spectrum and how this kind of teaching can cause harm to all sorts of systems and experiences. Chapter 11. Plurality The phenomenon of plurality is unknown to most mental health clinicians. Most professionals know this condition is dissociative identity disorder, although plurality and dissociative identity disorder are not exactly the same. Being plural, or having two or more people existing in one body or space, is just one part of the diagnosis of dissociative identity disorder. Many people who are plural do not experience distress from the existence of others within themselves. Eric Yabra, Transgender Mental Health, American Psychiatric Association Press. Hello, we are Obscura. I, we, are plural. We consider ourselves to be more than one person in one body. Plural is an umbrella term encompassing all different experiences of being more than one. We consider our plurality to be a neurodivergence and of a neurominority. We collectively are obscure, and you may think of obscure as the judicial person. You will find that you are well accustomed to thinking of collections of people in this way. Even the About ISSTD page uses plural pronouns. We tend to flip between plural personal and singular personal pronouns as it feels natural, and to some extent differentiate between what I think and what we believe. We aren't in the self-diagnosed DID panel simply because we don't identify with DID in any way. We do not identify with nor claim the diagnoses of DID, OSDD, PDID, MPD, or anything along those lines. But our experience was considered important to share because it highlights the issue here from another angle. I, as an individual of Obscura, am likely unable to tell you what my name is at this very moment, but that does not mean that I have an unstable sense of self. This is a disability we acquired because of what we suffered just over a year ago now at the hands of several mental health professionals. Before those events, we were readily capable of knowing clearly and precisely who we were and capable of switching at will, or rather, switching at consensus, but that has become disrupted. Due to the extended psychological abuse and neglect last year, one of our headmates died. Her partner followed her into hell, just so she wouldn't be alone. While we do not consider our plurality a mental illness, Mental health professionals readily interpret our experience as dissociative identity disorder, even if our lack of distress and impairment stemming from our multiplicity and our cultural understanding of our plural nature should have prevented that characterization. No psychologist ever even questioned it, but merely took disorder for granted. When we have brought our plurality up, 
most have responded with fear, or otherwise attempted to burden us with shame. One psychologist, whom we have never met in person, took it upon themselves to justify their abuse of us and make sure that everyone else also felt entitled to abuse us in our best interests by marking us with the ID. Regardless of the truth of it, it is something that doctors and psychologists haven't felt entitled to know and entitled to share without question. Regardless of the truth of it, we believe this designation was used over and over again to justify lying to us, abusing us, hiding things from us, and doing things to and for us without consent in our best interests. And regardless of the truth of it, it has been used to make us suffer by people who thought they knew us from a few lines on a page better than we know ourselves. We are not strangers to this treatment, though. We have experienced many similar behaviours and beliefs some time ago, and even recently from professionals, in connection with gender identity disorder. I'm sure the name's just a coincidence, though. It seems mental health professionals often forget that not everything requires a hammer. It is important to remember that our plural existence is possible and healthy. The DSM-5 Techno Remix technically acknowledges this via emission, although it lacks clarity and insight due to unacknowledged ideological commitments prevalent in psychology. The ICD-11 specifically acknowledges this and considers the borderline with normality under its entry for DID, where it states that the presence of two or more distinct personality states does not always indicate the presence of a mental disorder. We make no claims about our plural origin and the nature of our plurality other than that we came to know ourselves along spiritualist lines and that we are the worst off mentally when we appear at our most singular. All we know is that we think, therefore we are. It is strange though. One must wonder, if it is the case that in times of trouble, people in positions of authority will often attempt to exemplify calm in order to instill calm, then why would, in times of peace, people in positions of authority turn to ridicule and distrust of those without authority, those they supposedly care about helping? Do those authorities feel threatened? Do they attempt to instill shame, perhaps? paint a target for communal shame. After all, burden shame can be a very effective tool to control people. Why? You've even heard big name psychologists brag openly on Twitter about using shame against their clients. In the client's best interests, of course. You know, just a thought. We are the Arcadian system. Um, we're made up of uh, around six people. My name is Dominic and I act as a gatekeeper and a protector for the system. Um, I'm most likely to also be joined by Danny, who most consider the host or ANP, uh, as well as a gatekeeper. All of us in the system are non-human and reside in our inner world, like Mind Palace. We are self or partially diagnosed with DID. Um, our pronouns are dependent on the fronting person. So for me, for example, it would be he, him. For Danny, for example, it would be she, her. And our physical body, as you see on screen, uh, is a white 35-year-old woman with mid-length blonde hair uh, tied back, blue eyes, wearing a black T-shirt, with actually a picture of a raven in front of a moon. I'm not sure if you can see that. And a blue blazer. And uh, we're very grateful to be part of this panel today. Thank you so much for being here and for introducing yourselves. The harmonic system, you want to go next? Sure. So we're the harmonic system. We use they and them. There are two hosts right now who blend together, main and two, like the number two. We have a handful of regular fronters, a bunch more people who are just inside somewhere, many of them anonymous, probably a few subsystems still being mapped, maybe a bunch more fragments and groups of other people who live other places inside that are usually hard to get to. We're heavy on passive influence and blending. So we mask pretty well as a singlet, even hiding the fact that we're a system from the hosts and many other headmates. We're also autistic and that's played a big factor in our system development. 
are collectively trans and feminine and non-binary, though there's a lot of boys in the system. There's at least a few people besides the hosts around front today, but I don't have any names right now. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Gavra system, you want to go next? Hi there. My name is Gavra. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm from the Moss system. I am currently one of the main fronters right now, and I'll probably be the only one talking tonight, but I might share comments from other people, members of the system as they come up. I am chubby, white, glasses, kind of wearing a knitted top, and bob length, purple hair. Thank you so much, and I'm so sorry for missing your name. The Autumn System, you want to go next? I believe you can hear me. It is a name for now. My pronouns individually are she, her, although I'm from the Autumn System, which is a very big system. From what we know, we have more than 100 headmates. We are from Brazil, which is not usually a country that's very well spoken to dealing with DID or STD and other dissociative disorders. Physically wise, we are a white system. We have wavy hair. We are using a gray tank top. <laughs> we are five feet tall. And collectively, we see ourselves as trans. For now, that's going to do it. Thank you so much. The paper system, you want to introduce yourself? Hello, we are the paper system, uh, as mentioned earlier. This is Pixie Dust. I am a fusion of our system host and one of our protectors. Collectively, our genders range like severely. Um, our host actually recently has become non binary. Previously, they went by he, him. They now use they, them. Our system, I believe we had one of our secretaries, Pastel do like just a long list and whatnot just keeping track of everyone we have at least 63 members of our system who aren't like just in headspace existing and yeah physical description we're 25 the body is african-american and physically male but you know great thank you so much for being here uh oh, to... sorry we are also oh, I... autistic <laughs> yes Great. Thank you so much for the addition. We appreciate it. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for uh, presenting in this panel. So we are doing, hosting this panel because there was a workshop at the, the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Association. And in that workshop, um, they talked about systems who self-diagnose and who either create or engage with system created content, especially educational content online. So we wanted to actually provide a platform for people who are self-diagnosed and give them a opportunity to share and have their voices heard on why they self-diagnose and what that process looked like for them. So my first question is, what made you initially discover that you are a system? And let's say anyone can uh, start, unless everyone starts talking at the same time. I can I can jump in, especially because I forgot our physical description. So, so we're white with dyed red hair, uh, wearing earrings and a black tank top right now. So... A few weird experiences were clues. Doing trance meditation and finding voices and presences in my head, having drastic changes in my perception, my body and gender, and realizing that one of my online personas, I seem to be channeling something different than me. Also, I couldn't recall most of my life and had recurring amnesia that was so bad. My wife joked that I'd forget our wedding. As memories started to come back, I got other clues like memories of noticing presences inside before and of researching dissociative disorders before. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Who wants to share their experience? So with us, it was quite, I think we've known for pretty much all our life. Although I think in the very early stages, it was more about feeling maybe different concepts within ourselves. So, you know, from an early age, we described ourselves in terms of these concepts like, you know, calculation, automation, protection, bravery, that type of thing. Then I think from probably about 10 onwards, our 
personalities kind of evolved. We gained more kind of solidified forms of gender. And what's interesting is our physicalities are quite based around, you know, childhood experiences or concepts that the body needed at the time. So, for example, I embody, I guess, what was I considered was considered scary when I was younger to ward off and protect from outside threat. So that's kind of how it progressed, I guess. But the actual label or self-identifying with uh, DID came much later, possibly my university career around about 18 plus, where I had more exposure to kind of neurodivergent communities and things like that. So thank you. Piotr, I'm assuming you want to go next. Um, hello, it's Damien again. For our system, it was, we are a mixed origin system. It means that different headmates in our system have different origins. So some of them can be traumagenic, others can be queogenic or endogenic. In my case, I am endogenic and I hold most of the memories, if not all, the memories of my body or my life. And for me as a child, I will, it was very naturalized for me to speak with my own headmates or to play with them when I was alone in my room. So for me, it was an experience that I have lived through my entire life. And once I became older, I realized that not all children had that experience. For the rest of my system that were not so aware, we, they discovered they were a system when we were 19 and we actually had more access to information because my language, Brazil, and in my country, of course, there is no research or no access to it. My, even though my country has over 200 million people, there is one only ex specialist oh my from the ISTD. ISTD, I don't know, sorry, the name, <laughs> that works here, which is a very far travel for me. So getting help with that matter was not a um, possible thing. And then once we became fluent on English, we could have more access to information. And that was when the rest of the system discovered. Sorry for extending myself so much. No, thank you so much for elaborating. That's a unique and important experience to share. Thank you. Did anyone else want to share their initial discovery? Sure. So I'm going to do my best to just speak from my own perspective and not on behalf of other members of the system, because I found out before other people did and made sort of this executive decision to keep it to myself. And so that process was really difficult for me because I had this information that had the ability to both be helpful and enlightening, but also destabilizing. So yeah, I would say 18 or 20, you know, I was having these very severe symptoms and I couldn't figure out what it was. I thought maybe am I schizophrenic? I'm having, you know, really severe, you know, but basically, you know, a lot of things that I identified as being a threat to my physical well-being, like finding myself somewhere I don't remember going, missing, you know, months of my life at a time, and also sort of very intrusive flashbacks that I'm now able to sort of identify with as members of the system who aren't necessarily oriented to time and place, but that's something that I was only able to identify later on after sort of realizing that this has to be what is going on. There really is no other option. It's a very stigmatized disorder, right? I mean, it, it was a very difficult thing for me to accept, but it was a very practical one because treatment for psychosis and schizophrenia is very different than treatment for DID. And, you know, I did try to get a diagnosis and treatment. I had a therapist do, try and do EMDR. And I would say I immediately blacked out. And, you know, the next time I fronted was like four months later. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm not going to do that again. You know, I'm not against it. I do think that different professionals have different things to offer. Uh, I just know for me, it just didn't work out that way. I was able to come to the conclusion and feel really solid about it. Thank you so much for sharing the paper system. Do you have anything to add on? Yes. And this is Pixel. 
early on, it was just me and Dust for the most part. We had little to no knowledge of like systemhood whatsoever. But during the early stages of childhood, we basically needed each other in a sense to where I had to be there for him for the most part. For us, it was less about having dissociative walls and more so like the aloneness aspect of everything. Bit of like acceptance on Dust's end, like having to come to terms with, hey, this other person is in my head and other such things. Okay, thank you, everyone. Let's move on to the next question, which is, what were the steps you took to learn more before you self-diagnosed? So far, it seems that all of you have this DI or OSDV experience before you found any information um, online, right? You might not have had the words to explain what you were experiencing, like the, the labels to explain what you were experiencing, but you all could maybe bring on the words in your own words what you are experiencing, which is interesting because the workshop from the ISSTD seemed to apply that everyone went on TikTok and then discovered I'm I'm plural, but so far that seems not the case. So my question to you all is, what were the steps you took to learn more before you actually self-diagnosed? So yeah, fast forward several years into our early stages of adulthood, right around when the pandemic hit, actually, I think prior to it, Dust was trying to just convince himself, like, I'm just a normal person. This is just some weird thing I'm dealing with. Uh, I'm going to try to, like, suppress this as much as possible. But just due to, like, the sheer, again, the loneliness, which is how we formed in the first place having to come to the conclusion of, okay, clearly uh, this is not just something I can silence. There's another person in here and I should probably listen to like what they have to say because they seem to at least have my benefit and have my back and know like, oh, okay, this is a situation that I can't handle on my own, which is very ironic because we were looking at like this whole self-love aspect of things. And for singlet, self-love is like, oh, okay, yeah, just have all these positive qualities about yourself and be accepting. And then Dust tried to do that. And he's like, why do I still feel empty? Well, <laughs> but literally we had no idea what a system even was. And then I think as the pandemic hit and we were just more clinically online in a sense than usual, we started not even really doing research. We just happened across something and we were like, is that what this is? Is that is that the thing that's going on with us right now? Because like, we didn't even question each other at this point. We just had no idea it was a thing other people had experienced. So it just came as a complete shock to us. And ever since then, we have had, you know, pretty huge like self-discovery kind of uh journey throughout our adult years one coming to terms with hey maybe some not so okay things happened early on and maybe these people don't really have our best interests at heart let's start like working towards you know having more independence which we're doing quite well for ourselves now so that's good but also we also had to like deal with our own instance of kind of like cis meds and here we are just like hey this might be a thing we're experiencing and then they're just like well you're doing it wrong <laughs> but yeah we've learned a lot about ourselves since then thank you i just want to add on and explain that cis meds is a word that uh, some people in the community use to describe people who strictly follow the medical model and on purpose harm or fans or fake claim other systems who don't have the exact same lived experience as they do so that everyone is on the same page what that means the arcadian system you want to go next sure um so hi it's danny so uh so what the steps we took were usually considered if there's an impairment or otherwise so previously we didn't really have we didn't consider ourselves to be impaired or anything like that so we didn't really seek anything but 
when I had some like kind of quite stressful events in adulthood, which was past kind of initial trauma or anything that was linked to the creation of the system, uh, it meant that kind of the communication and the like the co-consciousness that we shared previously had kind of broken down a little bit. But so we we had to work through that. And that was quite a really hard period because it was kind of a bit weird to be almost disconnected from from people. But in our own way, we kind of, you know, obviously didn't want to kind of expose ourselves. So we kind of dealt with it internally. And then once it settled, we actually thought we would seek kind of specialist medical and therapy advice to kind of just process and learn what had happened and also to see if there was anything that, you know, could help, you know, in, in the future if if that kind of communication breakdown occurred again. But uh, I was actually told by the specialists that because I no longer had an impairment, that they dismissed it and, you know, said that that essentially they noted it on my record, medical records that I had personas that I found helpful. And hence, I that's why I kind of said I had, a, well, I think Dominic said I had a partial diagnosis because it's we haven't got the official label, let's say, but it is on my medical notes that we have personas, so to speak. And we even went to like, there's actually a specialist trauma center near where I live. And they said that they would not actually be willing to offer any support or therapy because for the fear of making things worse so really what's just you know from having read academically as I say I'm I'm currently university student as well as uh, working and from the diagnostic manuals and things I've just self-identified as having DID and that's really what happened Thank you so much. Can I ask you a question? If you don't want to answer, that's okay. In the diagnostic assessment you had with these uh, clinicians, did you and were your system use the word personas or did they like started using that word? The, we didn't use that word. They introduced it, which was an interesting one. Um, I think because I don't know whether it was to invalidate the fact that we called them personalities who called them real entities like or whether that was just the way in which they wish to describe it but that's that's how they they put it down so yeah that's unfortunate i'm sorry your language choice was not respected thank you for answering and, and sharing Thanks. we appreciate it harmonic system you want to share next sure so this is the steps you took to learn more before you self-diagnosed so we talked to a lot of plurals online. Uh, we read a lot of stuff on like Pluralpedia and Ken Host and listened to the Chris's Many Minds on the Issue podcast, learning a lot about the nature of plurality from reading those sites and learning what the Chris's had to say about trauma and dissociation on the podcast. There's some really helpful systems that met via Twitter that pointed us towards books written by DID patients about their lives and a comprehensive book about dissociative phenomena. And that was all really helpful. There's there's some other stuff that's, you know, pre-self-diagnosis and our other answers that we've kind of drafted for later. So we'll circle back to that a little bit, but that's all for, for now for this. Thank you so much. Gavra, you want to answer this question? Sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like I touched on this a little bit before. I mean, it was a lot of trying to do my own detective work because I wasn't really being supported by the mental health professionals I was seeking out. And I mean, I also live in America, so there's definitely a class aspect to that because who can I access with Medicaid? It's students, you know, people who are not necessarily going to have as much experience. Not that an experienced person is necessarily better, but I definitely felt the lack of support in trying to figure out what was going on. And so, you know, I was very, very cautious of internet sources, maybe overly so, just because I, I didn't see them as reliable. And so I was doing a lot of reading of books and journals and, you know, lots and lots of looking into like the nature of psychosis and schizoaffective, because that's what I was like, maybe this is what's going on. And it was in a book 
about the psychology of trauma and schizophrenia and how the two interact. And it made, there was a short chapter and it was like, always keep in mind, you know, something that can look kind of like schizophrenia is this other thing. We're not really going to talk about it, but here's a quick little, what's up with that? And I was like, dissociate, like that was the first time I'd seen kind of dissociation can look like psychosis sometimes particularly in terms of like disconnection from surroundings and identity was you know what I was experiencing and so yeah once I had that looked into it I was like okay this is this is my experience but I'm I was also very cautious of criticism and like I said I kept it to myself for a while because I was in an abusive relationship and I was very wary of younger members of the system unfortunately feeling comfortable because they weren't in a safe space and it wasn't until a very feminine system member and a very masculine system member started throwing out each other's clothes that everyone kind of got the message thank you for sharing that must have been quite the experience uh, reminds me of that episode in United States of Terra where she like throws away all the clothes of all the hatmates. She like empties. She first she goes like the shoes of this hatmate, and then she just like throws out the whole box. And my heart breaks each time I see it. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> they come back later, so she has to buy new clothes. The autumn system. Want to share or answer this question? But it was here in the end with weekend. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I want to introduce my point of view. And then I'm going to let him speak by himself. I found out we were a plural system this year, February. And Vade is going to comment more on that later. But a trigger warning for medical abuse. Since a very young age, we were, we had a plural experience, of course, by our life and by everything we went through. And since a young age, we did therapy because they tried to find out what was up with us and then since then we were told by different therapists that we were entitled to different disorders or whatever they would try to tell us one of those things was bipolarity so at first that was our own language we had our own language to explain what we were experiencing but we didn't have the words to actually say those and then this year once um, most of us became aware that we were a system because a part of us knew, but they didn't let us be aware of that. We had to actually break through a lot of ablaze because we have heard for a long time that systems had to have like a host or be socially functional or just fit on a certain criteria in order to be accepted, not only by, I don't know, the therapy community, but also by their own plural community. And we didn't have access to others who would say differently. So once we actually came to be in more touch with the plural community, and for that I think to be for the private plural community they have, we could see that we didn't need to fit those standards in order to be seen by others that had either similar experiences. So for me, as a headmate, it was a lot link it to being able to see others having their own different experiences with something that I could relate to. And it was about breaking biases and making sure that I could not only hear my headmates quite physically, <laughs> but uh, actually understand them and have sympathy, empathy. It was about for us at first to learn to not only love each other, but to listen because each one of us have lived a completely different life that we could not picture together as a jigsaw. And that was our first step to actually self-diagnosing, recognizing that we were us. <laughs> That's it. But is not going to comment anything. <laughs> it said I said everything. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you so much for keeping your boundaries in check. I appreciate it. 
Okay, I think everyone answered his question. If now or later in this call, I forget anyone, please, please feel free to speak up and no, it is not on purpose. Um, the next question is, why did you diagnose yourself instead of pursuing or receiving a clinical diagnosis? And some people already answered this question, but for those who haven't, um, feel free to unmute yourself and share if you want to. Uh, I can go, I guess. <laughs> So I diagnosed myself as somewhere on the DID OSDD1 spectrum. I wasn't sure how distinct or elaborated headmates were at first. And while there was amnesia, it was more like lots of little memory gaps and fuzziness rather than blackouts, at least from my perspective. I later learned that blending and passive influence can lead to like recurrent gray outs where I know I was there, but probably cannot tell you what happened. In fact, changes to front typically involve people coming and going from a co-conscious semi-blend of individuals. We don't generally experience hard switches outside of crisis situations, which like a lot of this, like, okay, so we don't sound or look like a lot of the systems we've read about or seen portrayals of in movies. And so that's why we kind of explore this like, okay, well, let's go research and try to figure out what we are kind of thing. But yeah, so there's there's plenty of, of switching around who's the most dominant headmate within the blend at front and people come and go from the blend. And it's not really like a unified thing where people become one. It's it's very nebulous and blurry. So yeah, we were we were kind of thrown in the direction of self-diagnosis at first because it just didn't look like I thought DID would. So I was just doing all sorts of research on plurality and dissociative disorders in general. Thank you so much. Anyone else? You know, currently still living with abusers at the moment. We simply did not have any of the financial resources to seek professional help initially. And furthermore, after doing our own dependent research, we kind of realized just how heavily stigmatized plurality is in general. So that too adds to the fear aspect. The biggest hurdle right now currently is still just the financial side of things. We are employed currently and we are trying to save to leave and become independent and dismiss ourselves from the family and whatnot. But aside from that, as far as therapy is concerned, we have to like really, really like trust the system, not like us, but like the medical system surrounding uh trauma and dissociation because currently it feels like we're having to fight just to exist because we don't fit a certain bill which is very ironic coming from a science field because typically once you're presented with new or deferring information you do more research instead of just shutting people out but that's just my take on that a take we can appreciate. Thank you so much. Anyone else who wants to answer why did you diagnose yourself? It's Marco. I want to add on what Damien said earlier. Basically, to give a context to what I'm about to explain. In Brazil, um, we still do not have a translation for, for example, dissociative identity disorder. Even clinicians in my country still call it multiple personality disorder, exclusive. The guidelines and the DSM itself is mostly in English and French. There is no resources in my language, Portuguese, or my country for such. So even clinicians, they don't even have that possibility in their mind. That's not something that's researched on my country at all. Uh, not only for that, but also for our story of clinical trauma. We do not feel safe to open up with a therapist and be able to actually explore how that we could for such. And for us, um, we recently escaped an abusive situation. We lived in a very abusive household where we were not able to explore our plurality or actually search for help, clinical help. Not only we were not actually able to cover the costs but safety wise it was not possible 
And I think a lot of systems, not only us, face themselves in the same situation. Sometimes not only doesn't know that you are not that you are plural, but you dissociate from it because you need to protect yourself. And that's something that can make therapy a lot harder because as a patient, you are not able to seek further for more information. And for us too, we wanted to escape the situation we were in. If we were diagnosed, JD in my country is a disability. Therefore, we would not be able to have an income that we would be able to live by ourselves. So it was either seeking for a diagnosis or escaping an abusive situation and having a life. And that's not a choice that anyone should make. That's it. Thank you so much for sharing. And yeah, that's an important take. And it's good that everyone is aware especially the International Society for the Trauma Study and Association, that it works different in different countries. And um, indeed, the ISS2 guidelines are only available in English and French. So we hope that their new guidelines will be available in more languages so that clinicians all around the world can have access to the latest information and treatment guidelines. Uh, the next question is, will you ever pursue a clinical diagnosis? Maybe the people who absolutely don't want to <laughs> can answer and those we absolutely want to can answer um because of the time probably no just again my lack of faith with the medical i don't even know what to refer to them as but yeah the, the medical system around everything involving plurality just it, it's far too very blatantly stigmatized like, if we're not in a professional environment to where we're being respected, why would we abide by their guidelines? I want to ask if you can find a therapist who is respectful of your plurality and, and treat you in the way that you desire, you and your system, would you then consider working with them if you had the financial capabilities and, and all that, of course? We do live in America, so I imagine it being incredibly difficult. But yes, if given like proper time and respect, I think in finances, then yeah, I don't think we'd have any issue. It's truly just a matter of like the the care aspect, you know, it's like you can feel when someone despises you inherently. Thank you for elaborating. Anyone else wants to answer this question? I mean, I think it's quite poignant what Autumn and Ava said, to be fair, that um, I think coming from different countries and things that there are so different takes on, I mean, for example, what a disability is, how it's how it's perceived, how, how it affects daily life. I mean, we're lucky in the UK that it's not as, well, disability itself is not stigmatized, but I still feel that the label of DID is still one that is treated with immense stigma compared to quite a lot of different different conditions. And the only reason potentially why one would seek a label or otherwise or a diagnosis is for, I suppose, security or personal validation and you know it opens up medical options that wouldn't necessarily be available to you if you just self-diagnose however even from our experience of uh well rather being dismissed from um getting kind of treatment options and things for the fear of it it exacerbating symptoms it kind of defeats the purpose so i think our our um, take would be no we would not seek a clinical diagnosis unless we absolutely absolutely had to thank you for sharing we appreciate it anyone else wants to answer this i'll kind of offer a little bit of a different take real quick so we actually did pursue a dissociative specialist we have a lot of distress and issues that we needed to work on as a system and needed to do system mapping with some help and sought out a therapist who had a specialization in dissociative disorders and ended up getting a diagnosis, but ultimately receiving a diagnosis from a clinician didn't do much that self-diagnosing already hadn't like, and it, it didn't help with, with the denial or the doubt a whole lot. So like, 
I don't know. I mean, we have a diagnosis professionally, but I feel like that's just kind of an add-on and not really part of the process for us. Thank you for sharing. The next question is, in the end, what made you diagnose yourself and how long did the process like take for you? Around the time when, uh, again, the pandemic, that's around when we started learning more about plurality as a whole. We knew for certain that leaving here was just going to be like a marathon, metaphorically speaking. So leaving, having the proper finances for it definitely was going to take a while. We we feel trapped just, you know, inherently as a result of living here. But at the same time, us being trapped is what allowed us to be more in touch with ourselves, not only because the world was and kind of still is in an entire frenzy over the pandemic, but also just living with abusers during such an experience. It, I'd say it took about a year or so just of pure research alone. I'd say since we don't necessarily have like long-term dissociative memory loss, it's more so if you tell us something, we will probably immediately forget, which looking back on our experiences checks out quite a lot. It's like, yeah, let's forget that thing that just happened. But also in regards to like the other aspects, like we don't have blackouts necessarily. We're very distinct when different members of us front, but our whole thing is still the loneliness aspect. So we don't have walls for each other. It's more so just recognizing who is there. So I'd say for us, it would probably be OSDD. Again, not like fully concrete. And I don't even know if we use that criteria, all things considered with our stance regarding the medical association around association. I did not mean to rhyme, my goodness. Um, but yeah, like it fits us the most, 1B in particular. We definitely have like emotional dissociation regarding certain experiences because it's like we know what happened in regards to things of our past, but we feel vastly detached from it at the same time. It's like, yeah, but who cares? And it's like, wait, we should care. This is literally how we formed. Mm, thank you for sharing. Who wants to go next? Hello, it is a veterinarian again. To reply to her question, I think for us, a system was in a very abusive situation. It was a path to healing, to understanding, to escape, to being able to create a plan that long term would work. Because as individual headmates, when we would switch, we would sometimes have plans. Some of us, in fact, didn't want to leave the situation because it was so normalized that we could not imagine to live another life. So for us, it was a matter of finding the language and the resources that we needed in order to escape, to survive. And as for in how long it took, I did say that for some of us, it took about years for the ones that knew for a long time. For the ones of us that were aware around this year, it took a few months. There is someone in our system called Darcy that still says, I am a singlet, which is a meme for our system. <laughs> but there is that. <laughs> Thank you. That's so funny because that's such a plural word, like no singlet without knowing a plural calls themselves singlet. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else wants to answer this? Our self-diagnosis was, was fairly slow as well. Like we had done some research in the past on dissociative disorders a few times. And since November of last year, which started the whole, uh, my plural, are we plural process? A few weeks into that, it's like, okay, so not only do we seem to be plural, but also we might have a dissociative disorder. And so we started to suspect DID or OSDD one within a few more weeks of that, but maybe it took a couple more months to really feel like it was probably closer to covert DID than OSDD one. Cause you know, you kind of have to map out, well, how much amnesia do I really have when I have amnesia for my amnesia? <laughs> so 
story of my life. Thank you for sharing. We appreciate that. Anyone else? I mean, as I'm reflecting on this question, it's just very funny to me because different members of the system have very different answers. And so I'm trying to go towards just sharing my experience, which is kind of difficult because most of the time, I feel like what I'm, what I try to do is take everyone's experiences and thoughts that I know of and try and synthesize it into something that's as coherent as I can make it, cohesive, if that makes sense. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that makes DID hard to self-diagnose is because, uh, at least for me, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best to piece things together as much as possible. But the fact that it is difficult to piece things together, that I, I was having so many situations that I, I didn't have an answer to other than DID is what made me diagnose myself. And for me, the process was about four years from starting to question it to being like, okay, I feel firmly that this is definitely what's going on. Thank you so much. The next question is, do you experience clinical distress and do you feel comfortable sharing something about that? I won't call any names, so you can just unmute if you want to. Can I ask a clarifying question? Could you describe clinical distress and what that means? Well, that is a very interesting question because that is very objective. <laughs> what that means but i guess it means experiencing for example how the I, icd-11 explains it is when your switches feel like intrusive having amnesia can be clinical distress because it can be scary for example gaffrey you said earlier that you um, found yourself in places and you didn't know how you got there or where you were maybe that could be experienced uh, described as clinical distress but what it exactly is will differ per person and also you know when you go to a clinician and you explain your experience there they they assess if you experience clinical distress and so what they label as clinical distress and what you experience as clinical distress might also um, vary. I hope that that answer helps a little bit. Would emotional amnesia, would that classify as clinical distress? If for you it's clinical distress, sure. If you just want to use a different word in clinical distress, like uh, is, is your experience difficult or painful or complicated? Does it bring you in complicated situations, for example? Something like that. I guess I'll start. So, I mean, as we mentioned before, th there are elements to it where we can switch or carousel or otherwise without necessarily meaning to. We are lucky that obviously the management of the system, the system is very connected, luckily. So in a lot of situations, it doesn't really affect us or, again, as you quite rightly said, we've talked about impairment. Usually when one is being diagnosed for a disorder, it has to come as associated with some kind of impairment or clinical distress, as, you, as you're calling it here. And I think for us, you know, that the process of switching without necessarily wanting can be not only distressful for the person who is trying to be out, but also stressful for the person coming out who wasn't necessarily expecting to. So to give an example, um, when we were having kind of very difficult times in, during adulthood, we would have Dan, who is, I would consider potentially a child alter, I suppose. He's in his teens, but still coming out during like work or otherwise, which you know, obviously, at that point, it's it's difficult because, and as you may tell, quite a lot of our voices are actually quite distinct. So to try and mask that is actually quite difficult. But, you know, again, it's been a long journey and process of understanding what might trigger those switches, you know, how to maybe mask in certain situations or we have you know taken time to talk to each other about okay if this situation comes up you know what what we can do what they can do to safely leave or navigate the situation to then actually you know make it more acceptable but again it's it's one of the um questions i think danny posed on 
social media, which is, you know, that isn't needed. It's maybe not even, not even an impairment if society was open enough to be able to actually accept that switches can occur and actually, you know, there may be certain benefits to that that switch or that thing that was potentially an intention for that. So again, I guess the clinical distress also comes with a sense of, you know, conforming to societal norms as well and whether that therefore makes you anxious or, you know, feel bad because you're not conforming to that norm. Yes, thank you so much. It's called the social model of disability justice, if I remember correctly. That's a very important point. Thank you so much. Anyone else wants to explain something about their clinical distress? Okay. All right. Uh, we'll be pretty quick. So first read of this question, it was like, does engaging with clinicians cause me distress? The answer to that is yes, especially when they are disinclined to listen to the voices of the community. But then after realizing what it was referring to, <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of... Uh, a lot of inner turmoil and a lot of people barging into each other's thoughts. And it can be fairly distressing, disorienting, and lead to a lot of just weird, weird experiences. And, and those can be a lot to navigate just on top of the, the, the plurality, just the, um, all the, the blurry stuff that happens for us is, is really disorienting sometimes and a source of distress as well as amnesia. And then we have, you know, co-occurring issues as well that tie into the dissociation a lot of the time. So thank you so much. The autumn system, we're going to go next. I do want to take, I want to give two takes about this. First is, um, I'm going to use one of my headmates as an example. We have a headmate in my system who carries a lot of trauma. And for that matter, Sometimes in trigger dates or other hard moments, this one had made tends to front. The clinical distress here for us is not about our body keeps a score or anything like that. It's about the lack of support when before we were aware of plurality that we would not be able to support our head. We would not be able to be there to listen to them. And after we were actually aware of plurality and we had a language that we could use for that. We were able to slowly build trust and slowly be able to support them better, which lowered our clinical distress so much. For me, I will speak about labels, but I am a protector. This other handmaid is what many call a persecutor. And I had a lot of clinical distress because I was told for a very long time by the clinicians or whatever, that whoever has that role is always someone who's going to cause distress, someone who's going to cause war. And the clinical distress was there because I was not able to build trust. I was not able to not perceive my headmate as a threat, which would lead to internal fights, which was another type of clinical distress. We would harm each other, not meaning to, because we were not invited to build community trust and a healthy relationship or just heal the best. So I guess a lot of, for us in our experience, a lot of clinical distress is more caused by the lack of support, love, and communication than anything else. Thanks so much. Anyone else wants to answer this question? I believe we have a slightly better understanding of the question now after hearing other people elaborate with their experiences. Our clinical distress has less to do with switches or situational experiences. It's more for us, sometimes our own dissociation gets in the way of us hearing each other and we'll get into like instances of questioning ourselves just from an aspect of like, hey, are we real right now? And a lot of us are very close to each other as well. So to lose someone even briefly can be extremely distressing for us because it's like, hey, this person like has helped me through a lot of instances. It might not even be a distressing situation externally, but just purely like 
just dissociating in general can sometimes lead to us having memory loss of each other to some extent not to where we'll like completely forget each other or anything but we won't remember like very recent experiences with other headmates and it hurts a lot especially when we kind of rely on each other to survive a lot of the trauma we face thank you so much before we move on to the next question i just want to say thank you all for sharing so openly and i want to remind everyone who's watching that these people are voluntarily participating in this panel they are in no way obliged to share their full story trauma complications distress whatever with you all so please don't try to armchair diagnose these people that's not why we are here and and obviously everyone just has a few minutes to share what they want to share on the open internet so thank you for keeping that in mind everyone and thank you to all our panel members for sharing so openly we really appreciate it and this uh, conversation and uh, that we're creating together my next question is was online educational content by other systems that you found online empowering and helpful to you and if so how if it's okay i'm gonna address the clinical distress question and then move on to this so i what the arcadian system sorry i forgot who was saying really stood out to me this idea of impairment and like functionality because you know i i talked about this a little bit earlier yeah i guess you know that could be described as clinical distress you know i was like collapsing in the road because i couldn't control my body right and it's like go into a clinician and they're like, sounds like you have anxiety, right? It's like, okay, whatever. We're a traumagenic system, you know, and DID can be very, very protective. And I, I think a lot of why I found myself being dismissed so much is because I, I can fit the profile of functional, you know? I, I think that that's kind of used as leverage in a way that I, that is set up against clinical distress, but I don't think is actually contradictory. A lot of symptoms, I think, come from trauma and not necessarily the fact that we're a system, if that makes sense. We, we are sharing, you know, that, which has its own issues, but I guess, I don't feel like I'm articulating that very well, but I, I did just want to speak on that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, some people say the trauma is the problem, not the people not the headmates or the altars or whatever word you use. Thank you so much. My next question is, was online educational content by other systems empowering and helpful to you? And if so, how? Yes, extremely so. Because when I say there was little to nothing in regards to things that we have personally experienced, explaining anything, touching on plurality, I mean, like, you look on TV and they use you as a punchline you look in other forms of media and it's like a gimmick or something, right? For, for us, heck, even we would laugh along whilst having conversations with each other because we were so blind to, you know, the humor and what was fueling or the, rather the foundation of said humor. Because it's not just like, he he ha ah, ah, look at this goofy person. They're so wacky. It's like, its own entire thing and it's interestingly enough extremely alienating from what others would consider the norm so to be able to finally like see people who were going through what you were going through but not in just a way to where it was like you could point it out and be like hey i recognize what this is it was more so like wait this is a thing like, what we're going through isn't this extremely weird, like, we can't tell anyone about this kind of deal. Like, we were extremely tight-knit about it just because we knew we'd have to still face the outside world, right? And it was not something we wanted to just put out there. So knowing that other people had not only had similar experiences, but were comfortable enough to properly articulate their experiences and like back each other up, it was like, wow, this is a whole thing. 
we were blown away that it was even something we could research, let alone something that we could, you know, tie to our own experiences. I'm, I'm rambling, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Dear Keegan, Sissimi, you want to go next? Yes, please. So I just have to agree completely with Papa. Like, I mean, some of the research that we're doing at the moment for our PhD is based around kind of online communities and things for actually the other two conditions we have, which are Tourette's and autism. And, you know, from having recently started reaching out on for DID as well, it just it, it just mirrors the same kind of kinship and support network and therapeutic kind of aspects from like other neurodivergent communities as well um that you know i think i think a lot of people it's about accessibility as well so not everybody's privileged to be able to go and look at a lot of academic you know medical journals or or things and to be frank like you may not have access to the education to actually understand those those journals let alone anything else so you know it's a bit of privilege really to be able to do it in that fashion so actually having a platform which is accessible a platform which talks to people who have lived experience who can kind of you know translate some of the high-end kind of intellectual kind of language and actually make it into a, a thing that's open and as a resource I think is so powerful and um, you know I just think I applaud anybody who actually does that. Thank you so much. Anyone else who wants to answer this question? I just want to start out by saying thank you to all the systems that are out there putting out content that is so I don't I don't know what the right word is. It's grounding. It's giving voice to experiences that maybe we don't even know we're experiencing, if that makes sense. And I kind of hit a wall in terms of like, okay, I'm looking at all this clinical guidelines. I'm looking at how a therapist would treat me, you know, and it's, I, I wasn't able to do it. I wasn't able to figure it out, you know, and I, I was just having debilitating brain fog and things like that, you know, and I, I started looking at content by systems and just something like, oh, have you tried asking questions? It's okay. Because so much clinical content was very, that I was running into, was very much against sort of any discussion of system members as though they had any level of legitimacy or existence or perspective. And I, I wasn't able to make any headway or improvement in my day-to-day -day life using that, you know. But when I stopped and was like, hey, everybody, what's going on? You know, that's that's when I was, you know, able to really make strides. And also, you know, it's really useful to be able to have terms and words to use to describe experiences. And you know, I don't necessarily experience this, but I know a lot of other members of the system do just this idea of like watching while, for example, I or somebody else in fronting, you know, and experiencing life that way. It, it was only through content by other systems that they felt seen and heard. Thank you so much for sharing. Anyone else wants to answer this? Sure. So a lot of plural content from the plural community has been extremely helpful for us because it prioritizes functioning as a team and headmates understanding themselves above focusing on system origins and direct trauma work. And trauma work is absolutely important for systems you need to do that, but being able to function better together as a system is an important stabilization step first. Most of our seven months so far with the dissociative specialist has been focused on stabilization, developing an inner sense of safety, empathy for self and headmates, learning to cooperate. And, and yeah, someone had mentioned that trauma is the problem, not the people. I mean, the reason that we don't function well as a team in the past, we're getting better is because we have been hurt in deep ways. It's, it's taken people a lot of time to learn boundaries and stuff internally. And um, honestly, like the plural community having emphasis on headmates 
figuring out who they are and, and their distinctness is, is really helpful for like working on some of those internal boundary issues. So there's a lot of great stuff from the Pearl community that, that we found really, really helpful and empowering. Thank you so much. Anyone else? It's a really interesting harmonic system that you shared that it was helpful for you and your system to invest in getting to know your individual headmates. And that is also one of the main talking points of in the ISSTD workshop that was brought up, that that is not beneficial because it, it doesn't lead to fusion integration, which we know most people... Uh, don't aim to achieve in the first place. Those would do. That's great. Uh, but if you don't want that in the first place, then what's the danger in not, you know, aiming for that and instead getting to know who's actually in your system? Does anyone want to share something on that? You can go first. Yeah, I, I, I want to just kind of jump into that. So, yeah, that particular point about that that headmates elaborating is is bad. Like. <sighs> Honestly, our headmates not elaborating more is probably a trauma response because when we have hid less, we have experienced more hurt and more misunderstanding. And that has encouraged people to hide more and mask more and blend more. And the lack of elaboration, honestly, is probably a trauma response for us and something that we need to work through. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, if I may, this ideology of like achieving final fusion in a sense for a system, whenever any clinician, therapist, psychiatrist, whenever anyone in the like mental health medical field looks at dissociation or DID or OSDD and says, yeah, you guys should try to like be a single person. Is it wrong to draw comparisons to conversion therapy? I mean, just genuinely, because that's what it feels like. Like, something's inherently wrong with you that you can't control. Change it, fix it, be normal. Yes, about personhood and being individual people or entities or headmates or whatever word you uh, prefer other than parts of one personality. Uh, the only reason they actually gave in this workshop, I really sincerely hope they have more reasons that they didn't list, but the only reason they gave in the in the workshop was that if we are individual people instead of one person with parts, then when we commit a crime, someone in court can argue that we are we can be sent to jail because only one or some of us committed the crime in our community system responsibility is a big thing right so i don't know anyone who is like saying that within our community but apparently in the clinical community this is a legit concern they have it has apparently been brought up in the past by maybe clinicians or a lawyer i'm not a 100 percent sure who brought it up but yeah so <laughs> anyone wants to say something about that and uh, yeah go ahead okay like Anyone with a degree can speak over you and have more authority towards their opinion, right? And it's so easy to silence someone with a degree and be like, well, you don't know what you're talking about, and I know more about you and people who are like you who experience these things because I've studied it, and here's the record and proof to show for it. So whenever you hear an opinion like, yeah, system accountability isn't a thing, you all are individuals, you go, because that's, that's what you want, right? You want to be acknowledged as individuals. And it's like, it's kind of the same thing to where you have extremely poor conduct with any form of a disability besides uh, plurality, and you use that as a crutch for bad behavior. Like we're autistic, for example, if we were to use our autism to have poor social conduct in a manner that was unacceptable, that we internally knew was against our own morals, then that would also be shameful, right? So for this idea that systems, you know, dissociative walls are not just not being responsible for their own actions as a collective system, 
is frankly dismissive and it feels I'm trying to think of the word basically the word i'm trying to describe when you are speaking over someone else's experiences in a way that's damaging to them it's like slanderous yeah thank you anyone else yeah i'm gonna say with my experience of being an interloper so for example you know i'm currently doing a phd i'm an academic researcher you know and not a lot of people know all my labels that i have so it's very interesting to see the perspective of people and i was actually going to put this on the end of what else you might want to talk about but uh, i think there's a couple of points like one is obviously that there is the notion that everything should be eliminated or cured um thanks medical model and therefore that's been perpetuated as part of the whole system i think there's also a fear of acknowledgement that actually medical fables still affect the understanding of modern day practice and you know it's very rare to find practitioners that are open minded to consider all sides of that they're just kind of given this kind of narrative that you know that that this is black and white that these are the guidelines, that these are the, the things that you need to look for, that disability is an impairment, needs to be assisted, you know, whereas I think there's much less focus on actually kind of just mental well-being rather than mental health and, you know, obviously trying to, trying to you know, make everybody well. So, and, you know, even, even when I'm, so I'm, I'm, I, open about the fact that I have Tourette's and I'm a researcher in Tourette's and even then you know as soon as I reveal the secret that you know that there's there's thing to my peers who are also researchers who obviously don't have the condition they you know consider that you know I often get say how can you do that because you're going to be biased with your research and all that kind of stuff and I'm like well actually no it's a strength because you know I there's all research is biased to the researcher and how they interpret the data that they're collate, collating, right? But at least, I guess, if you have some knowledge of the condition from a lived experience, as well as as well as like analyzing other people's experiences, you you get a bit of a more insight, more kinship with what you're actually analyzing. So, I think there's just several things that that community needs to really open up to is include lived experience include representation in your conferences in your um, training in anything that you're doing because otherwise you're not getting the full picture and you are literally just perpetuating these medical fables that are harmful and disrespectful to the community which you're trying to serve Rant over, sorry. Um. Thank you so much. Here, here, as they say in the UK. Um, <laughs> anyone else who wants to add on? Um, I can always it here. It's all over. <laughs> uh, I want to add something. It is a uh, tough I have for a while. I think from a financial perspective, for therapists, is much more they are going to gain so much more money trying to make you integrate than to get well with your system. Because in six months, one year, you're going to get well. You're going to map your system. You're going to learn how to build community, how to build relationships. Of course, you're going to have to work through trauma and everything else. But that's going to take a lot less of time than six to 12 years. That's like the average for a system to integrate. The difference of money they're going to make in that time is a, for me, a motivator. And I don't think we can misinterpret that because it's there. Unfortunately, people are moved by money. <laughs> That's the, how the world works. So sometimes I look at clinicians and the medical community in general, and I question, are they really attending to our interests and our well-being or their wallets? Because in the end of the month, I need to eat 
and I need to get along, I need to survive. And they're going to have a lot more patience to see, but they're really just focusing on whatever money they can extract from me and not my real well-being. Thank you for sharing that uh, valid yet concerning point. I just wanted to highlight really quick the harmonic system, what they said about um, like the goals being different because I, I that wasn't something I put in place until just now is the insight that other systems can have on, okay, this is how you can make your day-to-day -day life easier versus fix your trauma, become one person. You know, it's like very different levels of feasibility. Uh, and so I, I think that that is part of potentially what makes content by, you know, in addition to just having the lived experience, just, you know, highlighting different, you know, goals that different systems can have. Thank you so much. Um, my addition is that therapy is often 45 minutes a week and there are only so many people in your system who can, you know, be there and, and benefit from that. Whereas uh, online content is always available and you can go back to it whenever you want. It's a big difference. The next question is about fake claiming, which means accusing other systems of uh, being fake, which is not something we're doing in this uh, call or, or in the comment section. <laughs> but my question is, what is your experience with and thoughts on fake claiming other systems slash singlets because some of them might not be systems? Just because we we didn't know if anyone would even feel comfortable because it's a very touchy subject, right? Someone basically telling you that your existence just isn't a thing, right? Just to your face. It's one thing when you tell that to someone who's a singlet because, you know, assuming that they have no experience with plurality, right? Because to them, they're just going to sit there, like, pinch themselves and look at you strangely and then just go on about their day. But when you're a system, it hits on a much more impactful level because it's like, that is extremely damaging. And hearing that when you, you know, care so deeply for your headmates or anyone else in your system, it's like, we, when we had first like very, very recently come to the term, or, excuse me, came to the realization that we were part of a system. We had come out to a former friend, former for reasons that might be obvious in a bit. They basically told us how they had a plural friend of their own. And because our experiences didn't perfectly align with theirs, that we were lying or that we weren't real or valid. And they went as far as to say that, you know, after just ghosting us for a few days and we had to reach out to them to find out what was up, they then told us that they had went behind our backs and revealed what we had shared with them regarding our plurality to a few of their other friends. But, you know, it's all good because they didn't name us or anything, right? because that just completely excuses a private conversation being shared with others. But one thing we were told is we reached the consensus that you all are probably not telling the truth or whatever, or that this is something else entirely. And they're all like, oh, yeah, you can probably talk to a therapist or whatever about it just to see why you would even want this. All this other stuff, like we got an entire like, thesis written on everything they disliked about us all from us expressing our plurality we obviously do not talk to this individual anymore but hearing that when for so many years you didn't even have like a name for what you were dealing with and then to go on and you know finally have something tangible to describe your experience and for you to be immediately shut down by someone, it definitely got to us on an extremely, extremely emotional level. So yeah, it, it wasn't very fun. Thank you for sharing. Harmonic system, I saw you unmuted earlier. You want to go next? Autumn system, do you want to go? You can if you want to. Okay, all right, all right, we'll go. We haven't been fake claimed 
online. I will not be surprised if it happens because people with autism often get targeted for harassment. We've seen it happen to others, and it looks terrifying. We have had plenty of people doubt us, doubt our plurality, and doubt our dissociation. But plenty of people doubted when we came out as trans feminine, too. So when you've spent a lifetime practicing hiding who you are because who you really were was unacceptable, is it really surprising when people don't really know you? I think it's it's really harmful to fake claim systems. Like, not only does it worsen the doubt and denial that a lot of systems have, but it can lead to harassment that does real harm to some many who might have a lot of trauma and to gatekeeping that can deprive some many of access to resources and support systems. So fake claiming is really, really bad. I don't, I don't know why people do it, but okay, that's it. Thank you so much for sharing. The autumn system, you want to go next? My take on fake claiming is two different things. This is where, anyway. <laughs> um, the first is, I feel like everyone as a society, we tend to try to build boxes for experiences, for labels, for people. And then as soon as we see someone who we fit inside that box, have a different experience with that, we say it's fake because it does not align with my experience. And I think everyone needs to have my experience in order to be valid, which is not true. Everyone can have a different experience and be inside a different experience and be inside the same community. But as well, for me, when you say that someone's fake claiming, you are disregarding whatever they're saying. So if a system says, I had this experience and it was wonderful for me, instead of trying to prove them wrong, what you can do to make them seem like they're failing or lying or just discredit them is saying they're fake. So you can just take away everything they have said about it or the experience they are sharing. It's also a way of controlling because when you have such strict guidelines to whatever system is or DAD is or SDD is, you control, you have the control of that. And once you have the control of a word of a label, you can control us how people are going to see it. So imagine if a therapist say, oh, this disorder is disabling. And then a, someone gets that label and says, but I live, I live with this and I'm functioning. I have a healthy relationship that breaks all the idea that they try to build around the same label. So fake claiming for me is nothing more than a way of invalidating someone who has an experience. Also, who can say what's plurality or not? There are singlets out there who have plurality ex plural experiences or just plural systems that can exp experience dissociation in different ways. And I don't think anyone is able actually to say this is valid or not. When you fake something, you fake that with a goal in mind. And you're going to stop doing that as soon as you reach your goal. And surviving is not a goal, it's a necessity. That's it. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I mean, I think fake claiming, and again about harmful content, which is the next question, I think, it's kind of all wrapped up in kind of a twisted dichotomy of, well, latent discrimination, sometimes romanticism about the condition itself, or sensationalism. And like Autumn quite correctly pointed out, you know, societal norms and the lack of control of those norms through self-expression you know, showing functionality and things seems to some like a trick of, you know, self-focus or self-indulgence, like something that's like a cry for fame or something, you know. And I think also potentially in adulthood as well, I think there's an expectation that you can control it, that, you know, you're to blame, that there's something that, you know, why can't you be more acceptable? Because you're more in control of yourself, supposedly. Uh, and I think, you know, people people are afraid of what they don't really understand or realise and therefore will essentially say that you're fake claiming or uh, one of the articles we've, we've recently read from the Tourette side of things as well is, is to do with mass psychogenic illness, that actually online content and things is causing people to basically be mass hypnotized or whatever to this romantic idealism of 
particular conditions and what it could potentially give people in return, which just seems very strange to us, to be fair. So, yes, that's basically what we think about it. Thank you. Anyone else wants to add on? I'm sorry, I forget who said exactly, but just that it's invalidating someone else's experience and who are you to say? I, I really agree with that sentiment. We, in a lot of ways, kind of fit this like clinical idea of like, this is what that looks like, you know? And even so, right, I, I still was like, you know, maybe I don't, you know, lots of like that doubt and struggle, right? And so I guess what's what's the goal and what's to gain by putting that on someone else? You do not experience this, you know? Is it a desire for like, legitimacy like distancing I am not like them I am that you know I I'm sure it comes from a lot of different places young people be they systems or singlets can express themselves a bit differently than adults and I I think that's normal and should be expected I know my experience you know getting into D DID online spaces you know I had to take a step back because it was a it was a lot of systems who were very destabilized, were still in, you know, abusive situations, you know, not to speak too much on that, um, but just that I couldn't take that on, but I, I can still recognize that that experience is real and that what they're going through is real. So I guess with this question of fake claiming, you know, I would just encourage people to like ground themselves in their own experience because I know that that's helped me in terms of is what they're experiencing real like I don't need to completely understand it in order to not be a dick yes thank you so much uh it's also singlets who have created this fake claiming market content and and you know hobby almost for some people to you know go on tiktok and try to find the fakers <clears throat> which is super harmful indeed i think but i think it's really important to acknowledge that it's not actually systems who, who started this or who grew that as big it is right now may i draw another comparison like the whole discrimination like uh, who stated that it was discriminatory i think it was arcadian if i'm not mistaken yeah it's very similar to the whole trans medicalist uh ideology that sprouted up to where it's like you're not really the gender you say you are you need to be more in touch with your body and all this other nonsense i see no difference with the structure of the mentality to where you can again you know, just replace someone who was trans with someone who is a system and say, you're not real because you, you know, you're just one person or, you know, you're just making all of this up. This is just make believe and whatnot. It's so interesting how the person who invalidated us, for example, they themselves were trans. And it's like, how do you not see the parallels with the things you're saying to us? with things that you've probably experienced yourself. Thank you for sharing. I saw a lot of people nodding their heads, like that's recognizable. So thank you for that um, add-on. The next question is, did you run into any harmful content? And if so, what did you do and how do you and your system keep each other safe online? I think very recently, like maybe on the cusp of last year, we saw like the r slash systems cringe thing or whatever because server moderators for a uh, plural system server we were in was bringing light to it with a petition to have it taken down because obviously the stuff on there was extremely damaging and harmful i think there is a level of importance to engaging in such content not from like a direct standpoint of just like yeah let's come on guys time to be sad like no but acknowledging the very real hatred and vitriol that is inherent when it comes to 
being open about being plural, right? Typically, whenever it's content like that, the way we protect ourselves is simply like only having like authorized system members to view said content in the first place. Like if something is too much for one of us, we'll definitely keep them away from front. But at the same time, we do not like on a regular basis, obviously, just every now and then we remind ourselves that these people do exist and they have a very real agenda that in an ironic sense can be validating to us because if we're able to look at something in its purest, like most passionate form, we can see it for what it is. And yeah, it's based on bigotry, simply put. I was told to refrain from swearing, so I'm not going to say what I actually think it is. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, anyone else wants to share if they ran into a harmful content and how they keep themselves safe? I think something that we see kind of ties in with a lot of the fake claiming is, is kind of insistence in certain DI support spaces about how systems are supposed to look or functioning and uh, these ideas that you can't have certain types of headmates or headmates can't be can't function certain ways within the system and like all of these these statements and assertions that fall well outside of what's actually stated in the the dsm-5 text revision and the icd-11 and and sometimes like so we usually try not to engage uh you can't change a lot of minds unfortunately but um, sometimes trying to just gently suggest the human mind is not fully understood no theory is perfect and clinical research is going to largely reflect the cohorts of patients which were chosen for that research uh, rather than all experiences. Sometimes people listen to that. Sometimes that's met with hostility. So, I, I mean, I, I think a lot of times just trying to stay out of it and, and trying to avoid that kind of thing is, is what we'll tend to do. Sometimes the temptation when people are just asserting that something has to be a certain way is like you're, you're quoting something that was that was disproven in a, you know, in, in recent research and is like a, a 25 year old idea. And I just, I have to step in here, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, honestly, just trying to stay away from it is, is what we usually do. Thank you so much. Let's move on to the next question. Thank you, everyone. What's one thing you wish people understood about your self-diagnosis and or experience? I will name you. And if you don't want to answer that's also okay. The Arcadian system, you want to go first? So you know one thing I would wish people would understand in general is just the fact that you know this is real it can't be switched off it's who we are you know and for some people it's it's not a choice like it's not like we woke up one day say hey what do we call to have like several people in our heads you know like and the fact that I know it's not for all, but for some systems, it's based on, you know, trauma or or things. And actually, it's not embraced that, you know, the mind is a powerful thing that actually, you know, this is an adaptive thing. It's actually a survival thing. It's something that is actually really clever um, because it's meant that you've been able to process certain traumas in certain ways and actually saved yourself from some some things that actually might have been too much if it had been processed all at once or or how things so you know don't devalue that don't don't kind of you know take that 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 point and I think the other thing is with self-diagnosis you know to again it's about privilege it's about about you know to all intents and purposes nobody can tell you who you are you kind of know how you experience the world and and things like that so to all intents and purposes is pretty much as valid as if somebody else told told you um especially you know it's it especially with conditions where there isn't like a you know a, a test i can't do a genetic test to say yes i'm i'm did or whatever and i think if you identify strongly with that label you identify strongly with the symptoms 
even if like okay say you don't have the exact thing you know being able to understand and work through those symptoms with a community that understands those symptoms as well you actually get to know yourself much better so again I think it's just about understanding that sometimes self-diagnosis is the only option uh you know lack of specialists lack of access or whatever and you know just being kind and embracing the fact that people need to go on their own journeys and to 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 heal and things like that so yeah that's that's my thing thank you so much um harmonic system you want to go next we would not have actually even gotten uh, uh help from a dissociative specialist or received a professional diagnosis without the self-diagnosis first because that's what put us on the path to actually finding a specialist was self-diagnosis despite okay so like and i can say that because we have been seeing psycho psychologists sorry psychologists and psychiatrists since early childhood and uh psychotherapists and and lcsws and stuff for the last three decades and and gotten so many different diagnoses and had so many problems and been in and out of outpatient treatment and inpatient treatment and rehabs and all sorts of things. And like, I've been able to go through some of those clinical notes and like the old like five axis system, right? And, and look at all that stuff and nobody ever wrote any dissociative symptoms down. And like, I know at some points we even talked about having some of them, like this was completely missed by all the clinicians. And now that we've actually found a specialist, like a clinician confirmed it, but we wouldn't have gotten there without self-diagnosis and, and doing research um, ourselves. And um, it's, I don't know, it's just so many systems are covert. Like I've seen the statistic that 96% of DID systems are covert systems. And I don't know the source for that statistic. I'd love to find it so that I can actually confirm that. But I mean, if there are so many covert systems, it is quite possible that clinicians will miss them many, many times. And I know there are statistics from uh, a few papers on how often clinicians misdiagnose DID systems, not just misdiagnose, but miss the diagnosis and don't notice anything at all. So like we, we couldn't have found a dissociative specialist without self-diagnosis because, you know, 30 years of therapies, people didn't, didn't find it. So <laughs> sorry, I rambled a little bit, but I, I think I kind of got my point across. All right, I'll shut up now. You definitely did. Thank you so much for sharing. We appreciate your insights and lived experience. Gavra, you want to go next? I just wanted to address the fact that it's for me, you know, it's a loss as well as a gain, you know, like the Arcadian system said, it's an adaptive thing. And, you know, I, I don't think it's in my future to ever experience, you know, life as a singlet, you know, and there's a lot of aspects of being a system that makes my life more beautiful and easier, you know, and lots of ways in which it makes it more difficult. And, and just kind of where I've landed, like the one takeaway, right? It's just a different way of being. And initially I hoped for that validation from science, like, okay, you know, look at my brainwaves, tell me that what I experience is real. You know, I wanted that so badly. And I finally feel at peace with knowing that I might never be able to definitively prove to someone who's, you know, committed to not believing me about what I experienced or even, you know, to a neutral party, I guess there's value and difference. And I am glad that we're able to come together to discuss. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your answers. Uh, the paper system, you want to go next? The absolute biggest thing I want to like stress so heavily, not just with our self-diagnosis, but self-diagnosis in general. When it comes to other diagnosis of even other mental dis, uh, disabilities or disorders, right? Many of the other ones are easier to prove on a psychological level because there are things beyond just a lived experience, like easy tells, so to speak, right? 
where plurality falls short is simply put not every system you know has been studied to such an extensive way and not all systems have access to that kind of study to begin with and the people in those medical and mental health positions often don't wish to even pursue those kind of studies to begin with because it's outside of their interest right so the biggest takeaway is don't believe the credibility behind current day research surrounding plurality because it is heavily stigmatized inherently just on the basis of their goals in comparison to what the goals of your own system might be and with that said every system's experience with plurality is different not only because they may have a different form of plurality, but go figure, we're all different as individuals, as is. There might be other mental factors along with the plurality that leads to your system forming differently, or you having different kinds of headmates, or you coping with and dealing with your plurality in different ways. Heck, you might be so wrought with dissociation that you don't even remember your trauma and reach the conclusion that you must be endogenic because it's so heavily blocked off. So yeah, just don't go around policing people with this made up rule book from psychiatrists saying you have to follow all of these rules to a perfect T or else you're not real. Just listen to systems. Thank you so much. We appreciate your answer. Autumn System, you want to answer the one thing you wish people knew? I will be quite honest. One thing that I wish people understood about our self-diagnosis is that I don't need a paper to tell me that from when I was five years old and I was speaking to my headmates in my room, I was playing my games, I was speaking, I was have my friends in my head from now that I am 19 and I need my system more than anything else and I have learned to love them, each single one of them. I don't need a paper to prove me that my experience is valid. Nothing is ever going to be more validating and healing then waking up in the morning and listening to my headmates' voices in my head. Nothing's gonna be more healing and more validating than my actual headmates. I don't need a clinician to recognize they exist because I don't need anyone else to tell me that what I have been through is real or not. Besides, clinicians and therapy is Western, is white medicine. You cannot say that others that don't have access to that or experience plurality in ways that are beyond medical lines our lives and not everything needs to be signed up by a doctor to be real yes science exists but science also begins with questions and most people just refuse to question anything thank you so much for sharing all of you Harmonic system brought up the statistic that 90 or 96% of people might be convert. That research, I also don't know the exact uh, where it comes from, but it's about clinical settings. So we always say when we hear that statistic that if they would take us all to a theme park, they would get a very different outcome than, you know, when we are in a therapy office. So I think they should redo the research and treat us all to a day in, I don't know, Disney? <laughs> the last question is, anything else you wish to share while you have the microphone? I will just uh, do the same round as before. The Arcadian system, you want to answer this question? I think I've done my soapbox thing already, so I probably won't do much more. But uh, yeah, it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to speak with you guys today and actually this is kind of a milestone for me because you know like although I'm I'm actually quite an open person in terms of you know a lot of my other disorders that I have this one because of 
you know, a lot of things that the other systems have brought up in terms of stigma. Um, otherwise, is actually the one that I have never really, you know, publicly come out to say, hey, so, and like, I honestly wouldn't know what would happen, for example, if I disclosed it to work or if I disclosed it to in, you know, professional settings. Um, within the UK setting obviously you know we've had Autumn talk about how that actually some some of that liberty might actually be taken away should should some some disclosure happen so you know it's quite profound really to put yourself out there and say actually this is a thing that somebody with yes somebody with a full-time job and you know it could potentially successful could be it like you know people aren't necessarily you know this is necessarily not necessarily the the reason that they're unsuccessful the reason that they're not going to be able to be successful in life and I just think that I'm I pray that hopefully one day that society is progressive enough that you know we can be part of society without having to mask and without having to kind of fear that we're going to be found out somehow along the way so thank you very much guys it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much uh for being here and for sharing your experiences harmonics is me want to go next we spent our whole lives struggling to be understood and, and we're trying to not really think about the video being recorded and people watching this. But I just, I think I just want to say, I, I encourage people to be gentle when you interact with, with folks with different experiences because you, you don't know what's in their head. Honestly, you might run into people that don't know what's in their own head either. And that's that's a reason to be extra gentle when you encounter things that you you don't understand or people whose experiences are are very different from yours. And I, I think it's just important to listen to people when they share their experiences and give them the benefit of the doubt and 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 be respectful of what people's lived experiences are. Uh, because we don't we don't mold our lived experiences around clinical research. Clinical research is driven by reports of lived experiences, and I, I think sometimes people get that get that flip flopped. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, uh, just uh, just be gentle is what I what I would encourage people to take away from this. Such a good point. Thank you so much um, for uh, sharing and being here. Gaffer, you want to go next? First, I wanted to share a memory from when I was really young. We were all trying to write the same, get our handwriting the same, talk the same, you know, and so it was this constant, you know, for for a good long while, you know, figuring out how to imitate each other without being aware that that was not a singlet experience per se, right? And not that I've had any close friends say, oh, that doesn't make sense, you know, when I've told them, they've all been like, oh, okay, <laughs> that tracks, right? But, you know, with the idea of saying, but you don't seem like multiple people, you know, it, the normal and the assumption is always going to be, well, hopefully not always, but is currently, you know, that each person is, you know, one person per body, you know? And so I, I, I think when we talk about, or when I think about this idea of legitimacy and saying his assistant, you know, this and that, right. It's like, I guess what I'm trying to say is elaboration is not the enemy. I, you know, in, in my experience, listening and not assuming and having the level of respect for members of my system as I would have for someone who has a separate body has been the biggest turning point and the biggest bridge to understanding and growth, collaboration, all that beautiful stuff. Thank you so much. We uh, appreciate you sharing your lived experience and your answers. Uh, the paper system, you want to go next? 
biggest takeaway from all of this, I feel like early on prior to this interview, right, we were dreading it, frankly, like nothing against any of you all, just the idea of being filmed and putting out our experience in such a raw way, like just just dysphoria aside, just for me not matching with the body's gender and whatnot, right? It it can be challenging, but after listening to everyone and hearing from what they had to say, I'm starting to realize that this is less of a discussion around like just plurality in and of itself and more so like a discussion defending systems right to exist in a sense because if we ourselves aren't you know brave enough to share our experiences with people to be on camera and recorded right if we can't say hey we're real and we exist then that's someone else who might be experiencing plurality not being able to relate to us or anyone else to like draw from that and say hey you know i'm dealing with this as well i can find support and comfort through this you know like considering how we felt prior to knowing anything about plurality i can say with confidence it was extremely lonely and extremely alienating so knowing that I don't want someone else to have that kind of experience and not at the very least have more resources. Like, obviously there's content that exists. That's how we were able to get to where we are with our plurality ourselves, but there's not enough of it and it's still not impactful enough because of the stigma surrounding it. It's one of those things to where it's actively being silenced and ridiculed and judged. I have no doubt in my mind that there's going to be some negative backlash after we share our experience and we fully accept that because I don't want to have to decide whether or not we deserve to exist. And if that means we have to deal with other people not accepting us then so be it but we're here and this is how we live our lives thank you so much for sharing we appreciate your answers and lives experience um, autumn system you wanna you have anything else you want to share there's like three thousand people in front right now so i'm sorry if i don't make any sense okay <laughs> first of all i want to thank you all for the opportunity and for the conversation. I'm sorry that I am sometimes anxious and I turn on my microphone and I shouldn't. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, from everything here, it's actually very healing to see that we are not lonely in our perception and then how we can, how much we can learn from each other. It's kind of, I want to say something for whoever is watching, I don't know if you're a singlet, if you're a new system, if you are system in discovery process, or if you're a system for a long time. I just think that your language to describe your own experience and your experiences through life from your individual headmates and as a collective are always valid and you can share it. You should not be afraid or ashamed. I know that sometimes the walk we have through life is rough. And altogether, we are told continuously that um, we should match a certain standard or a certain role. And no, you don't. You can just be yourselves, whoever you are, whatever your experience is, and whoever you want to be together. Know that as a system, you're valid, as a headmate, you're valid. And there's a community out there. When you share your experience and you allow people to share theirs, you open a whole new world where you can learn a lot. And I think that people should just assume more positive intent when they have discussions as a collective and as a community, because that's how we make progress. 
by assuming positive intent and listening to each other, not fighting to see. I cannot say this word. Um, <laughs> who has more righteousness about a claim or something like that? It's not about claiming. It's about embracing, loving, and understanding. That's it. Thank you so much for sharing. We appreciate your answers and lived experience. Thank you all so much, truly, for your fast responses, your dedication, sharing so openly, and yeah, for being here. We really appreciate it, and we think it's super important that your voices are are heard and that we amplify your voices uh, where the ISSTD didn't. So thank you, everyone, and we hope to see you at our next project and in the community. And uh, yeah, have a good time, so everyone. And Thank you, Stronghold. Thank yes. you for doing it. Thank you so much. This came out of nowhere from one of our system friends. Um, I can say with confidence it was a lovely experience hearing from all of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, it was it was great to hear from all the systems on this call. So good. Okay. We appreciate it. Good time zone. <laughs> See you all next time. Bye-bye. Take, right. Take care. <laughs>